Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text for the third Sunday in Lent, which falls on March 12th, 2023, are Exodus 17, 1 through 7, Psalm 95, Romans 5, 1 through 11, and John 4, 5 through 42. March 12th is important for many reasons. Most importantly is it happens to be Joy J. Moore's birthday. Yay, Joy J. Moore, happy birthday. Happy birthday uh, in advance, Joy, but I'm sure this will work its way into the pastoral prayers of many congregations <laughs> on Sunday, March 12th. <laughs> and we've got uh, we've got the Samaritan woman at the well, and I was doing some research on this uh, in my this new book I was reading. Uh, That's a good one. Called Belonging by Caroline M. Lewis. Congratulations. This is a book about John 4 and... Yeah, it is. Thank you for that, uh, Matt. I appreciate that. It is a a book came out in January and it is a walk through this remarkable conversation and looking at the ways in which she embodies key aspects of what does it mean to be a disciple follower of Jesus and how the conversation unfolds in such a way that these these aspects of of how do we imagine a life with Jesus uh, are are coming to fruition in her in her encounter with Jesus so it's a bible bible study slash reflective conversational type of book to be used would it any- make for a good gift for joy for her birthday it would yeah it would, good idea. It would. <laughs> would you take that? let me make a note of that yeah yeah well oh, yes yeah, so we have this sign i want What's it up? signed my birthday okay. wishes that it would be signed <laughs> i can do that so yeah this is a remarkable conversation and i i think going back to what we were talking about last week we you know where do you drop down in this conversation there's so much here and and, and it 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 really you know where you choose to uh, to land in in this in this conversation, in this dialogue, really, it again depends on what direction you want to go. But just to just to piggyback on last week when we were talking about John three sixteen and for God so loved the world, and then the thing that you mentioned, Joy, about, and then the Genesis text of how God's imagination for blessing was for the entire cosmos, mm-hmm. uh, John three sixteen, and then this story is really the uh, the example of that or the, the the kind of realness of it, if you will, because you really should include, I know it's a long story and I know I've said this a hundred times, but you really need to include the first verses mm-hmm. of the chapter because that it is really setting, coming directly off of Nicodemus, this is, this is the world. So John 4, 4, is but he had to go through he left judea that's verse three and started back to galilee because he's been in jerusalem with this conversation with nicodemus and now he's going back to galilee and then the text says uh the story says he had to go through samaria or it was necessary for him to go through samaria and of course geographically it is not and it was not and so this is a theological necessity and so my paraphrase is often Jesus saying to his disciples, you want to know what, what the world looks like? Well, I'll show you what the world looks like. We're going to Samaria. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's that theological necessity to find her. Uh, the entire, or one of the main themes of discipleship in the Gospel of John is finding Philip found Nathaniel and so and so found so and so. He goes there to find her, to find a witness, and uh, and so the and some of the things you talked about last week, Joy of of that initial misunderstanding, uh, and but then that leads her into this gradual progression of 
of recognition of who Jesus is, mm -hmm. from uh, from a thirsty Jew with no manners to somebody who Jesus has something that she needs, water, uh, to a prophet. That's the next point of the next passage. To could this be the Messiah? And then finally, Jesus saying, well, actually, not just the Messiah, I am, which is the culminating identity claim in John. It's not that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is, but Jesus is even more than that. He is the I am. So the first I am in this gospel, the absolute I am, where Jesus simply says, I am is to her. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's that progression that leads her to uh, to then invite her townspeople, just like Jesus did, come and see his disciples. And then the, um, the Samaritans come. And I think another theme here that in terms of, of uh, thinking about Lenten themes and such that we talked about is that last part of the of the passage, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know this is truly the Savior of the world. The the That word Savior, that's the only time it happens in the entire Gospel of John. And so this question of, as we think about the cross and resurrection and salvation, and what does the cross mean? And is that, you know, is that, is that what salvation is? This, this, this story kind of blows that up <laughs> and says, wait a minute. And it goes back to what I was talking about last week, that salvation is not located in the, in, in the, the event of the cross, but this, the larger reality of, mm -hmm. of God's invitation to relationship through Jesus or Jesus invitation to relationship with him mm -hmm. and with God that is at stake for each and every one of these encounters. And that is salvation. So, okay. Thus endeth the... Yeah. <laughs> the name of the book again, folks, Belonging. Oh, well, Belonging. Well, then that's what it's about. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that salvation is well, belonging. That's exactly what I talked about. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I talk about in the book, that salvation means to belong, to belong to God, to belong to a community. Uh, we'll see that with the man born blind who is restored to community, um, becomes a sheep of Jesus' own fold. Uh, and so, yeah, salvation is uh, is belonging. It's abiding, which the Samaritans will do, and uh, to minnow with God yeah. <laughs> and with uh, Jesus. So. It really, I think, it, and I think it's an important, um, it's an important theological theme for people to imagine just what is salvation, especially during Lent, when it's so focused on the cross and that that's our mean, and that's how we, that's how we imagine what and connect salvation to. And this gospel is not going to let you do that. <laughs> Sorry. And, and when we began um, uh, on Ash Wednesday, one of the R's that you that we talked about was this uh, reconciliation. And this is uh, a text that can be about um, the divisions between the Samaritans and the Jews. You can spend a lot of time with that division uh, or, or the male and the female or uh, what is often the case? Why is this woman coming alone in the heat of the day? And so many sermons have have been focused on that division that I think where we could be a light in the world, if I can use that language, is for the church to start talking about how do we heal those divisions? How do we heal what's what is dividing us as a nation, as a people, as as a community, um, as individuals? And, and that that would be telling this story where we are belonging to the community of God. And uh, I will uh, uh, often use this text uh, to get it that um, 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 Jesus had to go through Samaria. And um, Josephus says, if you want to get there the fastest way, he has to go through. through. But if you know about the divisions, a Jewish man, the last route he's going to take. 
And growing up in the uh, uh, 60s in, in, um, in Chicago, where my family was all from Mississippi, there were certain exits we didn't take. Uh, they were sundown cities. They were the places where myself, my family as African-Americans knew we don't take that journey. And yet some of those very places are the places that I'm able to enter into now, simply not because of a law, not because of the government, but because of the gospel. And uh, as, as we talked about last week, it's a journey. We haven't fully arrived there yet, but it's a whole lot better than it was for my grandparents. And so for us to spend less time on the division and more on the reconciliation, or as your book entitles it, on the belonging, I think is a great word for us through this season of Lent. You know, one of the things I've learned about this passage, I, I think from you, Caroline, that I really appreciate and I'm still kind of working out in my own mind is the way in which the dialogue is more than just a chance for Jesus to share more truth, which is kind of how it was with Nicodemus. I mean, Nicodemus asks a question and then Jesus goes. And But you've, you've pointed out the ways in which the dialogue, she is uh, a kind of a full conversation partner. And it's always, he's more responsive to she is than what we see in some other Bible stories where, again, sometimes dialogue is just a way to make a, a long speech on your own. Yeah. Uh, but that's also theologically substantive in terms of what's going on here, that that it's in the conversation, it's in the working things out. It's not that she's necessarily being evasive, although there's times where she's maybe changing the subject, but but the way that he sticks with her and that so theology is dialogical, first of all, I think among people, but theology or, or a, a faith journey or, a, or, or spirituality is dialogical with God and with the God who's willing to go with the you know, the ebbs and flows of how conversations work. Sometimes somebody takes a conversation a direction you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. And a, a good conversation partner goes there and follows there and pays attention to what's going on. And, and yeah. sometimes will veer you back to the things mm -hmm. they want to talk about. And so you pointed that out as not just literary device or not just good manners, but really being part of what theology looks like and mm -hmm. what coming to faith is supposed to look like. And I bring that up because for so many people, that's not their experience in the church mm -hmm. where their mm -hmm. questions aren't welcome. Their point of view isn't welcome. Okay. Church is presented as here's the stuff you need to subscribe to, um, which is there's a, so there's a beauty in the story around that that I just want to lift up, mm -hmm. which I think can come out through more than just a scripture reading, but I think through a creative sermon as well mm -hmm. that that. That, that somehow doesn't just talk about dialogue, but in some ways models it or models that kind of give and take, the kind of, I don't know, a better expression than just give and take that we see on display here. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you lifting that up, Matt, because it is one of the ways in which the narrative mode of the dial, the dialogue actually is making a theological claim. And so how do you get at this, the way in which the story is told, it's not a monologue. And so I always suggest when I'm working on this passage with preachers that you do it as a reader's theater so that mm -hmm. people can actually hear the back and forth. But one of the, but to, to get at that is it, it, belonging is about mutuality and reciprocity and it's about listening and it's about trust and uh, and and where are those places that you see that in this passage? I mean, she, to what extent, you know, she Jesus needs something from her before she needs something from recognizes she needs something from him. Right. Uh, she tells her truth. I don't have a husband. That's the deepest truth of her life. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus tells his I am. And so you have these moments in the in where you where it's it is that dialogical, conversational, mutual reciprocity that is at the heart of what of what relationship is supposed to be, including God. So she even goes back to the townspeople and says, you know, surely this isn't the Christ, is it? Uh, isn't the Messiah, is it? And uh, and in the way it's constructed in Greek is the expected answer is no. No, it isn't. But she doesn't let that 
prevent her from that witness. And so your your explanation to Matt of like how so much of how faith is constructed and belief is constructed in the church is about having all the answers. And I'm going to tell you what the answers are. This just goes against all of that <laughs> for those, the right. ways in which we think church works or faith works. Right. And the reaction to that has been every, there's a, a kind of faith where nothing matters anymore. Right. And, right. and this text right. works against that because Jesus is quite straightforward about certain aspects of who he is in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a parallel too, which uh, I love the way you just pulled out. Uh, there's a parallel in uh, the different ways individuals encounter uh, or enter into this journey of of meeting and knowing Christ. So with with Nicodemus, there's uh, there's there's almost this uh, gradual expansion of the conversation. So. There's, there's this back and forth between Nicodemus and Jesus that gets a little longer response from Jesus with each response. And so it's like, you're going to stay with the conversation, Nicodemus, then I'll tell you a little bit more. You got another question, Nicodemus, I'll answer you with a little bit more. And so it's, it's, it's a back and forth before Jesus does that lengthy uh, explanation that we get at the, the end of that exchange. And here, as you just described, Caroline, there's this exchange of, of, you know, what's my deepest identity? This is my deepest identity. What's my need? This is my need. And, and so it's a, a reciprocity in the exchange, but they're very different because the encounters are very, by different people. And Jesus shows up for both of them the way Jesus shows up for all of us at the point of where we need and can best encounter him. I think one other theme, and then we totally have to go on, <laughs> but, um, but that is that, you know, we talked about Lent as being, you know, what do you, uh, that usual, what do you give up for Lent? And mm -hmm. then we mentioned, well, what do we, what do you lean into that really shapes your identity and your sense of belonging to God? And if you went that direction, if you're kind of going with that direction during Lent this year, the detail of she left her water jar or her water jug behind or her bucket behind uh, could really be a powerful moment because uh, what does she, it, what do we need to leave behind? What do we need to leave behind in the well to, at the well to lean more into what it means to belong uh, with God, to lean into that relationship? And so, uh, so the book is actually dedicated to all the to all who need to leave their water jug behind, uh, and oh, so it's a, a way in which we also can think about Lent in maybe a different kind of way, not giving up, uh, but leaving behind things that uh, prevent full relationship and full belonging with God. I mentioned last week that some of these Old Testament texts, this part of Lent, might be helpful for doing some congregational memory and. And here's one too, right? About a time of, of complaint, a time of lack, a time of worry about our future and our survival and, and God providing that people can tell stories about that. I mean, what's our, our Masa and Meribah, you know, our, um, mm -hmm. which I had to look up. Mm -hmm. I think, I think all three of us uh, probably could go back and work on our Hebrew a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I had to look it up. Test and Speak quarrel, right? <laughs> what's that? Speak for yourself. Well, I Jesus spoke Greek. Jesus spoke screen. Greek, so I'm following Jesus and reading the Septuagint. Uh, yeah, test and quarrel, right? The, where are the where are the places of testing, the places of quarreling, and how has God proven faithful uh, in the midst of that? Mm -hmm. um, and I the Psalm takes us there too, because in some ways, because it well mentions the same places. Same, yeah. Yeah, and it's really that's really the the I as I looked at this passage the. Thing that I circled, you know, is the Lord among us or not? Uh, that's really the the Samaritan's woman's woman's mm -hmm. question: <laughs> Is God is God with me or not? Is God mm -hmm. is the Lord with me or not? Uh, given her circumstances and uh, and and so and so I yes I yes okay that's it yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and then the question that follows that is, so what, right? So if God is with us, so what? Like, who is this God? Or what's what's the, 
what are the consequences of that for me, for my life, for my community? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Which is probably part of what's going on in this in John four as well, right? The, <clears throat> Jesus doesn't come in to say, "You Samaritans are all idiots," yeah. and uh, here's the good news: we're taking over and we're going to set you all straight. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a gentleness to the way he redirects certain assumptions that she makes, mm -hmm. and there's a obviously a deep humanity in how he um, how he kind of gets to that deep pain perhaps in her own life mm -hmm. a deep sense of loss or abandonment as well and mm -hmm. anyway i'm going back to john four look at me <laughs> I, mean, I'm gonna, I, I i i look at this um uh this this uh exodus text and also just um there's a bit of reminder of what it means to um lead a people to an encounter with god and uh, the moment of frustration that, you know, it's God that told Moses to lead these people out. It's God that told Moses to take them on this path. And Moses has been obedient and the people are quarreling with Moses. And Moses goes to God. And, and sometimes we have to remind ourselves in the midst of the journey that is taking us a roundabout way to get to the promise uh, that 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 uh, um, that allowed us to say yes to entering into this journey in the first place. It's taking a long time, but who do I turn to? I turn back to the one who made the promise. So I'm going to go back to God, and that's what the John passage has done. The encounter with Jesus is an encounter with the I Am, and here having you know this this constant presence of God, when they get thirsty, they ask the question, are we going to die? Is the Lord with us or not? And we have to go back and, and the answer to that question has to be, what has God done for us? That's the story we need to tell. Which is what Psalm 95 would reiterate. Mm -hmm. what, what, why do you want the Lord among you? Well, <laughs> because of all these things <laughs> because of all that yeah uh -huh. and so my noise will be a noise of praise not a noise of complaint mm -hmm. and i can rehearse all the things that which god has done yeah i i i i want to say this uh i've been reading um reading romans backwards uh by scott mcknight which is an interesting way of setting the context for reading uh, Romans. So when, when to, to, to spoiler, to get to chapters five, six, seven, and eight, um, uh, Scott starts with the end of Romans and then goes back to the beginning of Romans to say, now we can hear. So the therefore is set in the context of who's strong and who's weak and if you think about it, when a letter is written or when somebody's writing something, they kind of have an idea. It's not, you know, it's sort of like, okay, I'm just going to pick up the pen and go free flow. I know that is a way of writing, but usually we kind of know where we're going. And um, reading Romans backwards, as McKnight is doing, actually puts the context of who the strong and weak are and then goes back to the beginning so that the therefore of this five, six, seven, and eight, which we're beginning here with the first uh, 11 verses of chapter five, um, this sense we are justified and have this peace is, is a collective, uh, a communal response that isn't about the division anymore. I mean, the, the anti-Judaism that sometimes comes in, in, in our readings uh, I think this introduction to read backwards, um, read Romans backwards might help us not to read this in this way and to read it more collectively as people who have encountered Jesus. I just throw that out there as another book for folks to read. <laughs> but not until you've read Caroline's book, right, Caroline? Not until you've read Belong. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I appreciate that, especially because Romans is, you know, otherwise you try to read it as some kind of doctrinal treatise mm -hmm. yeah 
and it'll burn you out in a hurry, but if, to try to get a sense of what's going on in these Roman house churches and what like where Paul's trying to, to take them toward. The, uh, you know, we, uh, people often point at verses three and four and this idea about suffering and endurance and hope. And then people were always quick to say, but we know that's not true, or at least not true for everybody at all times. And this is a place where I think we want to read Romans communally and say your, your chances of coming out of suffering and producing endurance and ending up at hope are probably better. Your odds are probably much better if you're in community. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a community that's willing to let you go slowly and willing to take its time, I'll go back to John four and be in conversation with you and do all the give and take, all the ebb and flow uh, with that, because that's the, the I'm going to sound old here. The, the theological life I realize more and more just goes at such a, a it, it takes its time, right? It takes time to be able to look back on something and see where God has taken you. And I think that movement from suffering through endurance to hope is similar that you, I don't see that as a process you can ever rush.